Hey, everybody. Darren Voros here. Today, I'm here with Dave Putin, and we're going to talk all about corporate structure and when you should be setting up a corporation as a real estate investor. Before we get into it with Dave, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell. Please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Dave, um, you are not only an accountant, but I know that you uh, advise a lot of real estate investors. You're a real estate investor yourself. So why don't you give us a bit of an intro on who you are for those of you that haven't met you or that don't work with you already. Give us a bit sure. of a background and what you do. Yeah, thanks, Darren. So uh, I'm the senior partner at Real File CPA. So we're a full service CPA firm uh, with uh, clients all across Canada and the United States. Um, I originally am a Forensic auditor, that's my training. Um, and forensic means uh, to make use in court or for use in court. So my training was originally as a criminal investigator um, and forensics uh, in terms of accounting was with the criminal investigations division at CRA. So tax fraud, tax evasion, things like that um, with, with minor stays in other places like international tax, et cetera. Um, our firm, is uh, meeting a, a, a very particular need that uh, you probably know quite well, and that is um, assisting small and medium-sized investors with uh, structuring for, for holding real estate, but also being able to conserve what they're making long-term. Um, in this, uh, I mean, real estate investing is, is everywhere right now, um, but to be able to get the advisory uh, to make sure that you aren't uh, putting all kinds of hoops in your way. Um, a lot of times it's going to cost several hundred dollars an hour to go to one of the big four firms, which, which tend to be the only ones who provide the service. So that's where we came in about six years ago. My partner, Alan and I um, started real file CPA with that idea that we know a lot of real estate investors and uh, they're, they're just not getting the support they need. Let's talk a little bit about corporate structure because this is probably the, the biggest question I get when it comes to accounting. You know, uh, when yeah. should I set up a corporation? Should I set up a corporation? And I know there's a lot of varying um, degrees probably to answer there, but in your, um, in your best, you know, in, in your opinion, when is the best time or is there a, a, you know, a threshold that you want to set up a corporation and start working inside of a corporate structure? The things that differentiate um, corporate activity from, from just sole proprietorship for me would be things like the size of, of the, uh, uh, the size of the endeavor, the size of the portfolio you're growing, um, your risk, uh, how, how exposed will you be to um, potential lawsuits, to other creditors, et cetera. And then the third part would be long-term, what are the plans for what you're acquiring? Are you looking to grow something that one, you can be able to draw down in your lifetime, maybe to fund a retirement um, alongside a pension or in, in place of a pension, or, uh, and or are you looking to grow something that you wanna pass along to somebody, whether they be children um, or a charity or other beneficiaries? Um, so those are the, the three questions that routinely I try to get answers from, from a client before I say, uh, let's go ahead and incorporate. Not one of them is more important than the other. In fact, you might just say, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm only getting four properties. I'm only going to buy four properties and, and they might only be condos. Uh, and, uh, but you might say, uh, I'm, I'm 47 years old and, and I'm going to keep these condos for 25 years and I want to hand them over to my children. That's my plan. Well, if you were to buy those condominiums in your personal name, if the plan for these was to give them to somebody, then you are not going to be able to execute that plan in the end. Your goal, your vision to give it to them, you're not going to be able to do it because there will be such a massive tax burden on those condominiums that what you want to achieve um, will result in whoever's taking them over being massively out of pocket to pay the taxes to get what you want to give them, right? So it might just be, that you have this idea, you, you're putting something together, you wanna to give to somebody. So a corporation would be one of the, the two alternatives, the other one being a family trust, um, to be able to make that happen. Break down the, the different structures that we can have. You mentioned the family trust, you mentioned the corporation. Yeah. I know a lot of real estate investors go with the, the sort of the, I call it the triangle. You've got the parent company, the real estate holding company and the operating company. Uh, explain the differences between those, those sure. structures. Yeah, there's, 
You know, when I was uh, 18, I remember somebody saying, I'm going to incorporate and I'm going to have all these write-offs. And I thought, wow, corporations are all about write-offs. Isn't that great? Jerry, all these big companies, they write off everything. You don't even know what a write-off is. <laughs> do you? No, I don't. <laughs> but they do. And they're the ones writing it off. <laughs> and we run up against this in real estate investing as well. Um, we have a lot of clients who come to us that have just joined a, a membership in some association and, and uh, paid a lot of money to join somewhere, which is great. They're getting support, but they are so excited about things like the membership and an incorporation in place and particulars of incorporating. What do I have to do to incorporate? And all these things. And what I want to remind people is your first job is to go out and find properties and make money and, and build a business. Incorporating or setting up a partnership or anything else does not take the place of the first primary concern, which is you've got to grow a business here. That's what we're trying to do. Okay. So, um, and part of that for successful people is having a vision of what's going to happen. All right. And um, it doesn't have to be a, uh, a perfectly uh, articulated vision. It can be somewhat uh, nebulous at the start, but we need something to go on. So when, when clients come to us and say, well, we want to um, do this particular type of real estate investing. So we would run through the opportunities for them to do that, um, the forms that, that they might use. So you could do it in your personal name. You could do it, which if you were running a business in your personal name, you'd call that a sole proprietorship. Um, in real estate investing, you, you'd just call it uh, uh, investing in your personal name, right? It'd still be a sole proprietorship, but owning it in your personal name. Um, then you'd have a partnership, which is two people coming together. Um, you could have a joint venture, which is uh, like a partnership, but there are important differences between the two, particularly in terms of how they are taxed, okay? And in terms of liability, um, you could have a trust set up. And a trust is a very important tax planning vehicle as well. A lot of times it goes along with a corporation. Um, and a trust has many of the same characteristics that a corporation has. Um, but uh, there are things that you can get with one that you can't get with the other. Uh, and then the next part that they would have would be a corporation. In the United States, by the way, and I don't know, uh, Darren, if, if you have some of your uh, viewers that are investing in the States, but they have several more opportunities in the States to structure yourself. They have um, LLCs, they have hybrids, they have triple LPs, double LPs. They have a whole other type of S corporations, a number of different ways that we don't have in Canada. Those, those ones in Canada are the main ones we have. In Canada, we don't have LLCs. And in fact, using an LLC directly for Canadian in the U.S. would be problematic, which may be the subject of another uh, uh, you know, Zoom call at some point. But that's really the, you know, those structures that we look at, we want to see the business that you have in mind, what you're planning to do with your vision, what structure will it fit into, taking into account those three main things, wealth conservation, liability protection, um, and being able to grow it in a tax efficient way. And that's going to be the next question that's going to pop up for many people because they're going to realize they're a little bit further down the line than they'd like to be without having maybe gone with a corporate structure, what's the, what is the retroactive uh, um, ability to, to set up a corporation later on and move properties over to the corporation? And I know that's going to differ from province to province and location to location, because there's going to be different costs in each area, but give us a, a basic rundown of how that can work or if it even does work. Right. So you can move any asset you want into a corporation at any point in time, anywhere in Canada. Okay. Um, in certain uh, provinces, there are land transfer taxes that have to be paid. And in jurisdictions like Toronto, within the province of Ontario, there's an additional land transfer tax that has to be paid. So you really get into whether it makes sense financially to move properties into a corporation. Um, we've had clients spend tens of thousands of dollars on land transfer taxes uh, to move something in because there was a very particular estate planning reason. Like, I own this property, and I want it to go to my grandchildren, three grandchildren, um, 
And so I'm willing to up uh, upfront pay those taxes that are payable so that they can get this by way of, of uh, the, the plan that's put in place through the corporate shares. Um, but you know, uh, provinces like Alberta, for instance, where there's no land transfer tax, very, very uh, rudimentary exercise to move a property from your personal name to a corporation. The, the things that you have to keep in mind though are that you might already have a mortgage on your property. Well, when you move a property from your personal name to a corporation, you're ending a mortgage in your personal name and you're starting a mortgage in your corporation and you will have to notify the bank of that. They may charge you a break fee. They may charge you uh, uh, an additional uh, amount of, or, or a higher interest rate for a corporate mortgage. It's possible. Um, you can't also, by the way, um, and this is, has come to us uh, uh, many times, uh, unfortunately, after they've already done this, but the clients have um, bought a property in January and set up a, a corporation in March and at the end of the year reported everything as though it were in the corporation. Um, the corporation has to exist prior to the property being bought. Okay. Otherwise, you run into that problem of it being a transfer. You're going to have to pay the land transfer tax. If there's no land transfer tax, there are capital gains taxes payable. Right? If the property went up in value, you have to pay that tax before you can move the, or well, you can move it, but there are taxes payable. It's a disposition. Now, a lot of clients talk about, well, um, you know, someone told me I don't have to pay the tax. Well, that's not true. You can defer the taxes using a rollover, what's called a, a Section 85 rollover. Okay, but this is these are expensive things to do. And, you know, we'll take your money for doing it. I mean, we'll take the money, but I, we don't, I don't want to take the money. I, I, and I, you know, I will vouch for the number of times that we've actually done rollovers for clients is so small into the number of times I've talked people out of doing it because the main thing we want you to do is make money. And what you're going to do is cost yourself a whole lot of money by moving things over into a corporation, just because you think that's going to, uh, you know, somehow magically make you money. And it's not usually. Is there been a rule change in terms of passive investments and what they're taxed at and active investments? And can you define yeah. those two? A, a common question I'm asked when, when we talk about incorporating, and that is, um, well, why would I incorporate if the corporate tax rate is going to cost me 50.4% uh, or 53.4% or whatever the, the passive rate is, the highest marginal rate, and my personal rate is only 32%. Why would I do that? And it's a fair question. And in fact, if all you were going to do, look, incorporating isn't right for everyone. That's why we go through, you know, what's the, the plan, the vision, how much you're going to own, et cetera. Because if you're only going to own two properties, uh, two condominiums, and you don't have a long-term wealth conservation desire or, or beneficiaries to put this along to, or any of the other things we talked about, you don't have the risk exposure, the liability worries, then incorporation is going to be too expensive for you. It's going to be too expensive to set up. It's going to be too expensive to uh, do the compliance each year to pay the account to do the compliance work. But you're not going to pay more taxes than you would in your personal name. It isn't the tax part of it that's the most expensive part. So even though we talk about the rates being different, so it used to be that all corporations, active corps and, and passive corporations were taxed the same. Okay, we're going back to the 80s now. And the government and, and routinely people would buy properties and put them in their corporations um, and get active business rates on. And the government said, well, you know what? We don't like this idea of using corporations as a stockpile for these essentially passive land holdings and real estate holdings. So what we're going to do is we're going to initiate a regime called a dividend tax credit or a refundable dividend tax credit regime. And, you know, that's a fancy way of saying the government wanted to make sure that $1 tax in your personal name and $1 tax corporately end up being ultimately to the shareholder, the same after tax amount, whatever it is. So what they'll do is they'll take passive income that's earned in the corp and they'll tax it at the highest marginal rate. And it says, but well, we're keeping a sub ledger account over here, guys. We're keeping track of how much you paid because as soon as you declare yourselves a dividend and you take the money out of the company, we're gonna refund you some. So it's sort of, a, an idea that we don't want you stockpiling the money. If you stockpile the money in your corp passively, we're going to tax it at a highest marginal rate. So go ahead and pay yourself a dividend. Well, 
So that's the theory. That's called the theory of integration. So integration means the tax system is supposed to work corporately, flows personally, all tax the same. But here's, here's the thing that a, a quality real estate accountant does. The quality real estate accountant says, well, $1 over here and $1 here are supposed to be taxed the same ultimately to the shareholder. Well, we have the opportunity through various measures and, and expenditures and non-cash items available to us in a corporation so that $1 over here isn't taxed like $1 over here. It's taxed a lot less. Don't uh, completely disregard the high marginal rate. Just trust us. $1 over here is not taxed one over here for the right people. Trust us. Otherwise, there are at present over 400,000 corporations in Canada. We are the most incorporated country in the world. There's, there's one uh, for every 10 people in the country. There's a corporation. All these people would not be relying on accountants to set them up, and indeed many of them passively, if $1 were taxed the same as $1, okay? So um, the high passive rate, absolutely, but suffice it to say, you're never gonna pay more than that unless your accountant falls asleep, pay more than you would in your personal name, and all the opportunity is to pay a lot less through all the mechanisms that, that are sort of uh, tricks of the trade, so to speak. But they're not, they're not really tricks, they're rudimentary tax plan. What is your best advice for people when they're setting up their systems? Uh, I know you guys use a lot of uh, online QuickBooks, you know, zero receipt bank, all these kinds of things. Uh, what is your best advice for people when they're setting up their real estate investing business to baby to help their accountant and make the transition as easy as they can for 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 everybody right. involved in the, in that uh, situation? Traceability is the biggest part of this, right? And it's um, the the traceability as a former auditor, um, the accountants and clients who upon audit brought to me a perfectly prepared set of records with tabs and everything easily traceable to a bank account were the ones that I just leafed through and handed it back and, and closed the audit because they were, they, we just knew that these are well uh, run businesses that are, are, are properly accounting for things. Um, and tracing everything to, to expenditures. Um, we want clients to understand that when you're running a business, you're gonna have a lot of expenditures that you wouldn't necessarily have, um, be able to deduct if you were just doing things in your personal name. You, you might go out for a meeting with someone for a meal um, in, in better times than we're in right now, of course, but uh, the, the meal might be a business uh, meeting and that's an expenditure allowable to you um, in a corporation that perhaps isn't going to be allowable to you in your personal name. So we've got to be able to track all these expenditures. And moreover, you might be paying for some of these things out of your own pocket or on your own credit card. But in fact, you're doing it for your corporation. So how does that work, right? How do you get credit for what you paid for out of your personal pocket? Or Darren, I, I mean, I'm not telling tales out of school here. You own multiple companies, right? And some days you're doing business with this hat on and some days you're doing business with this hat. How do we make sure that it's going into the right bucket? And as long as we get it in the right bucket, first we recognize, hey, you spent this for business purposes. We wanna make sure you get to deduct it. Now let's get it into the right bucket um, and let's trace it. Let's trace everything to its original source by way of a bank record. Um, one of the great things um, that I had, uh, that I, you know, my experience at CRA, 14 years as a criminal investigator and auditor, um, multiple times in court. One of the great things I learned was things like receipts and what's allowed as an expense and what can you actually deduct and what do courts allow that CRA doesn't allow. So one thing I always ask people is because they've been told over and over again that they need a receipt um, to be able to deduct something for an expense. I say, well, where does it say that anywhere in any written document in the tax act. And, and of course, they've not read the tax act, but the point I'm making is a receipt does not get you an expenditure. It does not get you a deduction. And there are countless tax cases, court cases where the judge has allowed someone all kinds of deductions for which they had no receipts whatsoever, okay? Having said that, I like receipts. If we can keep receipts, that's fine. But the, um, the idea is if you're spending something for your business and it's believable we we just had a client who did um some work on um a native reserve and 
the people that uh, she, um, she, you know, she was building on the reserve um, had some casual labor, very averse to providing receipts to people on, you know, in that, in that scenario. And um, the auditor had disallowed it. And we said, this is a bona fide deduction that, that is an expenditure for business. So um, we can trace that to the bank account with the right sort of record keeping. Okay. And, and we utilize things like uh, receipt bank saw, uh, application, which is take a picture with your phone and it uploads. Um, we have probably 90% of our clients on QuickBooks online right now, not QuickBooks desk desktop. That's, if you're using Quis QuickBooks desktop, I really urge you to move over to the online version because um, it's real time. It allows instant access to, to your accountants um, and uh, it's much easier to use. So um, the applications like that, like HubDocs, um, these are the things that are going to allow you to properly trace for your own records so you know, hey, I spent money. Did I get credit for that? Oh, yeah, there it is. But also when CRA or if CRA asks, it's easily um, presentable in a, in a tremendous format for them to be able to just, like I would, sign off on and pass it back. Dave, I want to thank you for your time today. I know you're a super busy guy and, and I know that people are going to find this session hugely valuable. Again, I'm going to leave your contact information in uh, the description below. People can reach out to you. They can uh, tell you that I sent them to you um, and uh, you know, make sure that, uh, that they're just getting things set up properly and, and, and working with accountants that are specifically used to working with real estate investors. If you guys enjoyed the session with Dave today, you know what to do. Go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. With that, I want to say, Dave, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to be here with us. Um, I wish you the best of success. And I know you're a, you're a real estate investor as well. I wish you the best of success in your journey. And uh, I know we'll be talking very soon about, uh, about my business and everything you do to help me out. So thanks again for being here. Tremendous. Thanks for having me, Darren. Appreciate it.